hear me? Okay, that's better. Um, so uh, I've pulled up these web pages. Can we do something about that big light on there? Probably not. Yeah, I think Wendy said the lights were fixed. What? She said yeah. Wild in Europe, which is a movement um, amongst many European countries to uh, dedicate more spaces to wildlife and wild um, spaces. So they are trying um, to uh, generate both these places for the health of the planet, for the health of the animal population, but also there's a distinct uh, commercial uh, push behind it because they've seen what um, places like Jackson, for example, how places like Jackson can benefit from cultural and eco-tourism. So there is, uh, they're seeing those, the connections, um, like I thought the, the three words that they used to summarize the recent SHIFT program were perfect and uh, wonderfully applicable both to here and to what they're trying to do in Europe. And it was nature, culture, and adventure, I think. All those three things um, can make for a very interesting economic model, as well as a model that helps the earth, helps wildlife, etc. So what Rewild in Europe is uh, its own major force that's happening in Europe. They have a huge uphill battle. Um, just the fact that across these countries that um, you speak all these different languages, they've made up this word called rewilding, um, is indicative of uh, kind of the cultural uh, lack of knowledge or lack of understanding about what this could even be. So they've kind of used this rewilding term um, and all these different countries use it. It's a new word uh, to them. And it means taking back, obviously, places that have been managed by humans for centuries and centuries in Europe and turning them back into wild places. Um, the exhibit that we have in the King Gallery here ties directly into that. It is called Wild Wonders of Europe, and it's trying to promote that idea that there is wildlife in Europe and that there's this movement to generate more wildlife. You can see on the map over there, and we can talk about it a little bit more when we get in the gallery, just how many uh, places they've identified and wild species they're trying to both reintroduce and reinforce in terms of populations. The conference I went to was called Wild 10. It's the 10th World Wilderness Congress. They meet in a different place every two or three years or five years. It's not on a regular schedule. They meet when there's a significant topic um, to discuss, and so this time it was really focused on Europe. So I presented at a, what they call a plenary session, which means that it was not one of those conferences where there were 10 things going on at once. There was one thing after another, so I got to go in that part of it, which was a really nice thing for me because that means that we had a bigger audience for this presentation. And what I was trying to do was um, give an introduction to this museum and then talk a little bit about uh, uh, what we're doing in terms of exhibits and tie it to conservation so it's, it made sense to them uh, for the conservation audience. So it, the title I was sort of given was Wildlife Art Then and Now, and I added connections to conservation so it would make sense. Um, I showed them this map to begin with because I knew that they would be familiar with the Yellowstone to Yukon Corridor, just to give them a sense of, of where we are. And of course, we're down here at the bottom of the corridor, uh, right below the nation's first national park, the world's first national park, um, and this got a, a nice, uh, some nice sounds of recognition when I put it up on the screen. Um, then I showed them this, the, another uh, vision of, of where we live by Ansel Adams. Um, and then this is yet another vision of our landscape. Um, the National Elk Refuge, of course, is right across the road. And this to them is, uh, is a great example of what some of those places could become, right? We have five to 7,000 elk out there every winter, and it is definitely a tourist draw, but it's also, and many would argue, uh, helping the animals to survive. Um, so I gave a, I'm not gonna 
do this whole thing for you guys because you know what our mission and vision are. Um, I told them about the mission, the vision, and then talked a little bit about our collections uh, statement. And I really skewed this all uh, towards European wildlife because um, it was a European audience. And I think that they don't even quite realize the important art history um, that they have in terms of wildlife art. It's not a subject that you see in many museums. If museums have collections of these artists, they're often in the basement. Um, so I talked a little bit about Rosa Bonheur. Um, then I talked about art collection in general, art ranging from 2500 BC to today, um, the birdstone and then this great Barbara Castle piece with a still life um, inside a New York apartment. Uh, Indian baskets to contemporary glasswork, uh, European masters like Albrecht Durer to Bob Kuhn, and then traditional painting and sculpture to video installations. And my video did not transfer, so anyway, I was going to show a little picture from the Sam Easterson thing that we did, but it didn't work and it wasn't, I didn't have enough time to show it anyway. So, um, why am I here talking to you? Um, our collection and exhibits are inextricably tied to the concerns and issues being discussed here at Wild 10. The connections between art and science run particularly deep when looking at wildlife art. And to highlight that, I've talked about Darwin's legacy, the evolution of wildlife art, which was just going up on the walls as I was uh, giving this presentation, so that was fun. So what Darwin's legacy, and this will be instructive for when we go in there, examines how wildlife art has developed to incorporate an ecological vision of wildlife and habitats. Um, early wildlife art, uh, particularly, particularly in Europe, fell, and you can roughly categorize it into two categories. You have more scientific-oriented illustrations, like you see on the left. It's trying to show you a sense of an animal and its anatomy, not necessarily any behaviors or habitat, but you want to see what it looks like, you know, from the side and what its antlers look like and what it looks like from behind. You have that, or you have these um, completely imagined battles between uh, different subjects that probably would never actually do this in the wild. A lion and a white stallion battling is not a likely uh, scenario. Um, I talked a little bit about great European artists like Theodore Jericho, who um, has this wonderful painting in the Louvre called The Raft of the Medusa. Uh, we have this painting, as you all know, of the two lions. And where did Theodore Jericho go? Where did he go to study wildlife? He went to the Louvre. He did not go out into the um, wilderness <coughs> to study and observe lions. This is a painting by uh, Peter Paul Rubens that's in the Louvre, part of a cycle called the Marie de Medici cycle. So that's where he went when he wanted to know what a lion looked like. We uh, Also Antoine Louis Barry, as you know, the premier animalier uh, sculptor who everyone uh, owes a huge debt to in terms of the animal sculpting world. When he wanted to go and study animals, he went to the Jardin des Plants, the natural history and zoo um, in Paris. So he did not also go out and study animals in the wild. Along comes Charles Darwin with Origin of Species in 1859. That and subsequent writings really completely changed the way that we thought of ourselves in terms of our relationships uh, to the other creatures on this planet. Um, and this had a huge impact on the way animals were then depicted. Um, his vision of nature as a struggle for existence uh, amongst a huge variety of living organisms was influenced by those romantic renderings that you saw earlier. So you see that kind of battle scene going on, but after Darwin, it becomes uh, much more rooted in something that might actually happen out in the wild. So this great Joseph Wolf painting that we have um, reflects this, uh, this interest in um, animals that actually live in the same place and that might actually interact in this way. Joseph Wolf is credited as giving us the first truly ecological vision of life in the wild. He didn't just want to give you a scientific illustration. He didn't want to give you an imagined battle. He wanted to give you something that combined those two, so it was both uh, accurate and also engaging at the same time. Um, and so as we, as we begin to look at these artists and as artists begin to react to Darwin and to his influence, 
um, you get more and more interest in where the artist has traveled and the animals that they've actually seen out in the wilderness. So Joseph Wolf is right on the line. He never probably saw this uh, happen. When he painted this painting, um, there, this is an alpine ibex, there was 60 to 50 to 60 alpine ibexes left in the wild on one tiny royal preserve in Italy. This is an amazing comeback story because the alpine ibex, there are now thousands of them throughout the Alps uh, in Europe. And the Lammergeier is another uh, great success story. And what's really fun, connection between this painting, painted in 1850, 1848, yeah, 1850 something, um, is that the Rewilding Europe, Wild Wonders of Europe exhibit features these two creatures. So we've got this great connection between animals that have, are of interest today, and you can see that they were of interest 150 years ago. There's another great painting by Joseph Wolf, and this one sort of more, sh more completely shows the sort of cycle of life or a truly, a fully ecological vision, because you've got these falcons who are controlled by man, who are, because you can see the little um, tresses on the white falcon's leg, so that's a trained falcon. They're attacking this red kite, which is a wild bird, um, bringing him down, and then in the left background over here, and we can see this better in the painting, there are these rabbits that are running away. Um, so you can think of it as sort of a circle of life and then man's uh, influence on that. Perhaps the humans have sent uh, their falcons uh, to kill the kite so that they can save the rabbits, so that then there'll be more rabbits for the people to eat. Um, so Darwin's influence did not you know, take over immediately or completely, uh, and so I love this quote, Paul Meyerheim, you guys are familiar with this painting, which is in the Rungus Gallery. Paul Meyerheim was an instructor at the Berlin Art Academy. And even into the late 1800s, he was telling his students when they were composing a background or a landscape, he said, do like I do, place pieces of hard coal on the board, sprinkle sand in between, and you have the perfect desert. There's no need to actually go out in the desert and see what animals are doing out there. Just make up the background, no one cares. He's, he told his students to go to the zoo and study wildlife there. Um, he was influential, of course, on the group that we call the Big Four, but they all broke out and more followed the model begun by Darwin and Joseph Wolf than by Meyerheim. They all, these four artists, went out into the wilderness, studied creatures in their natural habitats, and then brought that knowledge back into the studio when they were creating their paintings. Um, I love this line picture because it looks exactly like what Meyerheim was talking about. So you can think about this maybe as an early Frieza painting where he wasn't exactly paying attention to the, to the uh, desert landscape, although he did go to Syria um, and he did go near the Egyptian border. So this may have been based on his actual travels, but it's a great example of, of little pieces of rocks with sand sprinkled in between. Uh, Frieza's most, uh, most important paintings are the ones he did based on his travels to, say, Spitsbergen in Norway, and based on his um, travels, or based on his access to royal hunting preserves. Um, so at this point, there were, the Wiesent, the European bison, only existed on European hunting uh, preserves, and so he had access to go see those animals, and in addition, his access to seeing red stags was um, greatly increased by his association with people like Kaiser Wilhelm II, who were great hunters and who had these wonderful areas um, that they kept and that they kept full of wildlife. Kunert, as you all know, went to Africa and India. Uh, one was the first European trained artist to really spend time on safari studying the wildlife and the natural behaviors of these creatures. This is a um, jackal, I think. And what he's got there in front of him are the feathers of a uh, guinea fowl. And so that's maybe not something that you would have painted if you hadn't seen it for yourself out in the wild. These great tigers, beautiful elephants, of course, in a natural habitat with something happening behind them that actually, you know, did happen and affected them. And then, of course, beautiful paintings of lions. He, lion, or William Cooner became known as Lion Cooner at the end of his life. Um, and then Carl Rungus, and you know all about his travels across North America. Um, and that he really claimed this territory as his own. 
from Wyoming, um, elk and bears, and then of course up into Canada and his beautiful paintings of moose. And then the last one, and I assume that they might be a little bit more familiar with Bruno Lillifors, but I don't think in fact that they were. Um, so Lillifors is known as you guys uh, are familiar with, with painting the, the bird life and the wildlife of Sweden. Um, this is a great, and Lillifors may be more than other artists. Uh, you can talk about Darwin a little bit uh, more closely. Um, this, you can talk about the rabbit and the way the rabbit changes color. You can talk about this guy in terms of natural coloration in this season and how he blends into the landscape. Talk this painting of the caper Cayley doing its mating uh, call and dance, which is very similar to our sage grouse here. This is about uh, natural selection and uh, sexual behavior amongst animals, um, which is very Darwin-esque. And then, of course, Little Forest painted these kind of dramatic battle scenes, but they were between creatures that, that might actually do these behaviors in the lot and in their natural settings. Um, so, I jumped ahead to wildlife art today, and I, I said most of it continues in this naturalist tradition. It's still incredibly important to go out in the field and study the animals and show where they live and what their natural behaviors are. But if you don't do that, some people break with that tradition, but you can't, um, you can't create art today uh, and ignore what has come before. You have to acknowledge that there's these naturalist uh, patterns beforehand. And this is, of course, our Walt Ford print of uh, the turkey, which Benjamin Franklin suggested would be a great emblem for the United States. And he's crushing the Carolina parakeet, which, um, as you know, the, we shot out to extinction in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So this is sort of a symbol of America um, killing the parakeet. Um, and also wildlife art today often incorporates distinct conservation or political message like this is. Um, so then I talked about our exhibit schedule and how it highlights conservation concerns. So we've had Fragile Nature by Joel Sartori, Great Plains by Michael Forsberg, The Last Ocean by John Weller. This uh, After Christmas we'll have Elegy African Wildlife Photography by Nick Brandt, which has a very pointed conservation message. Um, we have Wild Wonders of Europe up right now. Um, but we also have exhibits that are not photography that uh, are fairly conservation oriented. We've had a whole set of illustrations for the Lorax. We often show these in the endangered species uh, pictures by Andy Warhol. And sometimes we have an exhibit that's all about one painting. This uh, Mark Eberhardt's On the Edge was the focus of one of our collection spotlights two years ago, I think, when we received. Uh, we're also doing, of course, the Conservation Gallery, which will be open this fall, where we highlight stories of individual uh, animals from the tiger to the elephant to the wolf to the bison and talk about the successes or lack of successes that the conservation movement has had in saving them, but also how artists have represented those creatures uh, over time in that project. Talk about collaborative things that we've done, including Yellowstone Yukon, the journey of wildlife and art. Um, George Kaplan's American Buffalo, National Geographic, or exposed graphs of the American West. And I sort of ended with this, talking about shift as a great model for them to follow, in which you can combine all of these wonderful things, culture, adventure, and nature, into one package, um, which I think really is one of their main goals. Um, and then I went through some fun pictures of, you know, kids and all the different things that we do fancy parties, inspiring younger artists, having a bike to the museum night, having a fun run, doing yoga on the trail, uh, having something like mixed media aimed at the younger generation. A huge part of the conference was directed towards engaging 20 to 40 year olds, so I think this was uh, hit a note with them. And then my last question to the, to the audience was, what can we do with you? You know, come up and talk to me as the conference continues, and let's see if we can make some nice connections, and in fact, I, I did make some nice connections uh, in the days uh, following this presentation. So, that was basically